Okay. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around the Connect Meeting Room on the screen in front of you. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback to the CIDR website, cider.athabascau.ca. You are now being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. We have a good crowd here. Note in particular my name, Daniel Wilton, under Hosts. If you hover your mouse over my name, you'll see a pop-up allowing you to send me a private chat message. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, feel free to send me a private message and I'll try to help you out. Below the participant list is the chat area. Note that the chat is public and is recorded. Here you can post comments and responses to some of the more informal questions that might come up during the talk. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions in the Q&A after the presentation. The main window is of course the projection screen for the slides and above that you'll find a button showing a person with a raised hand. That is a pull-down menu with options to make the session a bit more interactive. You can give a smiley, applause. After the presentation, I'll release the microphone and open things up for a Q&A. A new button will appear and you can grab the mic, walkie-talkie style, to ask your questions. And here we go. Good morning everyone and welcome to the 8th CIDR session in the season series and the first session of spring from the Center of Distance Education at Athabasca University. As our regular audience members will know, we have over the years tended to give disproportionate attention to post-secondary education, but once a year we've had the opportunity to rectify that. For the past several years, we have been very fortunate to have a returning guest to present a State of the Nation report on K-12 online learning in Canada, and it has become an annual tradition reminding us that distance education reaches all ages in all regions of the country. Our speaker today is Dr. Michael Barbour, now the Director of Doctoral Studies at Sacred Heart University south of the border in Connecticut. Previously, he was Assistant Professor at Wayne State University in Detroit and holds a PhD in Instructional Technology and a Certificate in Adult Education from St. Francis Xavier. His background, however, is rooted in the secondary level and one of his research focuses has been on rural K-12 students learning in virtual school environments. He has been a teacher at Discovery Collegiate and director of the Center for Advanced Placement Education, where he provided web-based advanced placement courses to secondary students at his own school and throughout North America. Today he speaks on a range of topics, but his ongoing research into the state of K-12 online learning has been a valuable resource for this country. You'll see the names of his sponsors, a who's who of K-12 online education in Canada. Before I hand over the microphone, I'll just note our final two sessions for the season. Coming up on May 7th, we have Drs. Norman Vaughn, Randy Garrison, and Marty Cleveland Innes for a session on blended learning and communities of inquiry. And we'll round out our season on June 4th with Dale Dewhurst, John Mark Keyes, and Archie Zariski speaking on open educational resources in the development of legislative council. Last month, we had the pleasure of visiting Newfoundland for our session on feedback. While our guest today may have been claimed by the U.S., once a Newfoundlander, always a Newfoundlander. I am now passing the microphone to Michael Barbour. Note also that today's slides are posted on our site at cider.athabascau.ca. Feel free to use your applause buttons here. Everyone, welcome Dr. Michael Barbour. Thank you, Dan, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's good to see a, a, a nice crowd, and I'm actually recognizing most of the names that I see there, at least all of the ones that have first and last names. I, I recognize them, I think, about everyone except for maybe one or two folks in the audience. So it's good to know that uh, I guess our community is a little bit uh, small and intimate, and, um, and that's always a, a good way to be. Um, so as uh, Dan mentioned, um, I guess this is the probably the sixth or seventh CIDR session I've given over the last five or six years, and it's, I believe, the fourth one that I've given specifically upon this annual study. Um, so this particular study has been going on for six years, and uh, the first five years, as you can see, it was uh, sponsored a, a publication largely of the um, what was the North American Council for Online Learning and became the International Association for K-12 Online Learning. Although for the last two years, 
the uh, Open School of the British Columbia has been the actual publisher of this document. And uh, this past year, when uh, INACL decided that they um, didn't want to be involved with the publication anymore, um, it gave us a chance. And I see Adrian is in the audience here, who is my main contact at Open School BC, um, who has been a great individual to work with. And I see he's typing right now. Uh, we decided to make some changes to the, the document, including changing the cover. And you can see what Adrian and his team came up with there. And I know at least the feedback I've gotten so far on it is it seems to be a, a great change that we've experienced there. Um, I will mention that um, coming up next year, uh, we're actually going to be working with um, the Canadian eLearning Network, or Can eLearn, which is a new pan-Canadian organization focused upon uh, K-12 distance education or K-12 online and blended learning. And I see a number of folks in the room associated with that organization. And I'll mention uh, Randy Labonte and Verena Roberts in particular, who are uh, the executive director. And Verena's title changes from time to time. But I know it has something to do with being an innovation officer. Um, I think it's like chief innovation person or something like that. Um, there we go. Thank you, Randy. And. Um, so uh, it, I'm very excited about that because it, it finally becomes a completely Canadian um, or product at, at this stage. Um, I'd be remiss if, if I didn't mention the folks that actually make this possible, with the exception of the first year when INACO bore the entire costs. Um, every year since then, we've had some wonderful sponsors. And as you can see here, um, you know, many of these folks have been involved with the publication now for quite some time. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Open School BC for the last two years has been the publisher of this document. So, and I want to thank all those for that. And hopefully, working with with Randy and Verena and the rest of the folks at Candy Learn, we can continue that uh, process. So, I guess to get into sort of the nitty gritty of, of the article, um, as I mentioned, the um, sorry, the presentation and the actual report itself. Um, as I mentioned, the presentation or the report has been going on for six years now. And it's been interesting to see the development and the change of the organized, uh, the way in which K-12 distance education is organized across the country um, during that time period. And uh, when I get into some of the, the trends and, and some of the numbers in particular, I'll talk as to how some of that has changed during this time period. But one of the changes that you'll note when you're just looking at this particular document, this here essentially gives you where we've been getting the information from. Uh, and to provide you, I guess, with a, a little uh, code breaker here for those of you that, that aren't familiar with the report, the uh, KS uh, indicates key stakeholders, uh, DA indicates document analysis. Uh, the third one there, which you see fairly frequently, is MOE, which uh, for us Canadians is Ministry of Education, um, which comes, I guess, common to us. But for those of anyone in the audience that may not be from Canada, um, you note that uh, it's a term that they might not be familiar with. And then one that you see appearing this year, which is a relatively new one, is AANDC, which is the uh, Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada. And that appears down in the federal list. And you'll note that this is the first year we've actually had federal involvement. That's not necessarily because they did not want to be involved in the past. Uh, one of the things, and this is one of the major changes we made in the report this year, was in previous years, we had always rolled the First Nations, uh, Métis, and Inuit programs into the respective provinces that we were talking about. Um, and part of that was my own ignorance into the, the situation. And part of it was just simply it was convenient to do it that way. One of the things we did this year with the report was we made a concerted effort to um, pull out those First Nations, the, those F, uh, FNMI uh, programs to really highlight them, the regulatory regimes under which they worked, and also to look at the level of distance education that was being provided to that particular community. And one of the things that I'll talk about in, in later on in the presentation is uh, really particularly highlighting those folks since you know, while they've been included every year in the reports, and if you are familiar with them, particularly the brief issue papers and the vignettes that get included in each of the reports, one of the things that you'd note is you've seen these programs several times throughout the years. But this is really the first time we've organized them in a way that um, I guess is more intellectually honest to how they operate. So looking at 
what's happening across the country. Um, this is essentially the way in which each of the provinces and territories are organized. Um, so as you're sort of going, I guess, from east to west, being a native Newfoundlander, I always start in the east. Um, you'll note that the provinces of Newfoundland and Labrador, as well as Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, all have these single province-wide programs that, in each of those cases, are managed uh, at the ministry level, although in many instances, by a unit or division of the ministry that is at arm's length from the ministry. So while they're part of the ministry, they do have some flexibility in some cases. And I, I note that, that Sarah Hainsworth is in the room here, who's from the Nova Scotia Department of Education. Um, so she you know, would be able to uh, answer any questions that folks might have afterwards as to how that might be set up. And I don't want to put Sarah necessarily on the spot, but I'll mention this as we're going across the country because I see several folks in here and if there is a particular jurisdiction that you are interested in there's likely somebody in the room that um, can speak to that. Um, moving westward you've got provinces like Quebec, Ontario, Saskatchewan and British Columbia where the ministry tends not to be involved with the delivery of actual programs and it tends to be done either at the district level or on a multi-district level. Um, so in some cases you've got programs that operate in a single district and in other instances you've got programs that operate over multiple districts. Um, continuing our, our, our journey westward, uh, we're here in Manitoba and Alberta where they actually have a combination of, of the two systems. Uh, depending upon the mode of delivery, in some cases even the nature of the program, there are programs that have a province-wide scope. And then at the same time, there are also programs that have specifically a district-based uh, scope. Um, in most cases, like um, well, I guess like combining the other two options together, what you find is that the province-wide scope options tend to either be run by the ministry or run on behalf of the ministry at arm's length by some other organization. Uh, and then the district ones obviously run at the district level. Uh, the two other options that you see in the chart there um, really deal with the, the territories as well as Prince Edward Island. Um, in the case of, of the uh, Prince Edward Island as well as uh, the Nunavut Territory, these jurisdictions don't have their own distance education programs at this time. Um, so they rely primarily upon programs from other provinces. So uh, Prince Edward Island, for example, uses primarily the programs in New Brunswick, although um, my understanding is, is that uh, in the past they have used uh, programs from uh, Nova Scotia from time to time. Um, I don't know if, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head if they had any from Nova Scotia this past year, although um, my memory says that it probably wasn't in this last year that they had any. Um, and you know, this is one of those things that has changed over the life of the report. Um, because one of the things that uh, when the report first started being published, Prince Edward Island actually had a, I won't say a substantial, but they had a distance ed program that they were using. It was primarily video conference based. It was primarily at this stage for French as a second language courses. Um, it was getting limited use and each year it was fewer and fewer courses, fewer and fewer students until it was more cost efficient to essentially just purchase uh, space in another program from a, a different province than it was to build their own capacity. The interesting thing is the territories are sort of on the other end of that spectrum. Um, in all three instances, they primarily use programs from other districts, although you'll note the Yukon and the Northwest Territories have both been experimenting with programs of their own. In the case of, of the Yukon, it's been at the ministry level. In the case of the Northwest Territories, it's actually been a specific uh, education council up there that's been doing most of the work, the Beaufort Delta Education Council. Um, when the reports first started, UConn wasn't really doing much on their own. They had a, a, an incredibly small video conferencing program that uh, was running really at the same scope of roughly what Prince Edward Island was running at the time, you know, a dozen odd students or so. For the most part, they were purchasing space in programs in British Columbia and Alberta. Uh, primarily British Columbia, to be honest with you. Uh, 
Um, what we've seen over the last six years is that they've really started to build that internal capacity um, far beyond the, the video conferencing program that they've got. So they actually have an online school up there now you know, that's offering, I think last year it was something like a half dozen different courses, had a few dozen students involved in it, whereas you know, previous years, when we, well, when we first started the report, you might only see you know, five or six or ten students in their internal programs and then simply buying space in other programs. So to see some of the evolution that we've seen across the country, um, I mean, some of the takeaways that I, I look at it when I just you know look at and think about how this map has changed is the landscape is evolving, and in many instances it is evolving because of actions that the ministries have taken on the regulatory level. Either they've you know been investing in and getting more involved in distance education at the K-12 level, or it's because they've been divesting themselves of it and, and leaving that aspect to. Uh, you know, the individual district to figure out. And Saskatchewan is a good example of that. When we first started doing these studies, Saskatchewan actually would have had the same kind of map code there as what Manitoba and Alberta had. It had a province-based program. Um, actually, it looked very much like what Manitoba had, um, almost to a, a t an exact T, to be exact, uh, you know, to be specific. Um, but what uh, has changed is that the ministry decided that they weren't going to be in the, the business of providing distance education. So they devolved all of that to the districts and you know the districts have had to build capacity or partner in order to do that. And that's a similar kind of experience that British Columbia went through, although they went through that experience prior to us starting these reports. So you know, we've had these kind of changing landscapes here. The other thing that's been changing over the years is, is the number of uh, programs that are involved in each of the particular provinces. Um, as best we can tell, and, and I'll, I'll use that statement a couple of times throughout the um, presentation because there is some level of variability here. It, but as best we can tell, there are approximately 251 programs across the country. Um, I say approximately because, um, for example, in Manitoba, and in Ontario for that matter. There should be one program in every single school district that's there. They all have the ability to do it. Um, whether or not they're all actively offering them is a completely different story. Um, and each year, depending upon the number of people that respond as we start to send out uh, you know, these surveys to figure out who's doing what, in some cases we find that some districts aren't doing anything on the distance ed front this particular year or they're only using things that are being provided by the ministry and they're not doing any of their own programs. But you know, next year they could be doing these things. And then you know, there's another 40 to 80 percent, depending upon the province, that simply don't respond at all. Um, for the most part, it's really Ontario and Manitoba that sort of throw a wrench into these numbers. Um, and it is because of that district aspect. So when you're looking at the other provinces, the numbers that you see for the other provinces are fairly consistent. Um, and I would say that they're fairly accurate as well. We get a similar thing when we start to look at the number of distance education students that we have. Um, if you look at sort of the tracing the development over time, uh, the first time anyone bothered to give an estimate as to how many students were actually involved in, in distance education at the K-12 level, um, it, it, it varies, um, you know, sorry, I just was catching Verena's question there and it lost my train of thought. And it's actually probably good to go back and do this. Um, Verena, in the case, that's perfectly acceptable, Verena. Um, in the case of Ontario, it should be every public district and every Catholic school district that has them. What ends up happening is that, which would be, I think works out to 76, and then there's a half dozen private programs in the province, like Virtual High School Ontario, like um, Kiwetinik Internet High School, uh, like the uh, Amos uh, folks down in, in southern Ontario, like the uh, Canada E-School, which was the Ottawa Carleton E-School. Um, and there's actually a, um, an, on, it used to be the Ontario Private School Consortium, but now it's like the Canadian um, 
independent e-learning consortium. And I know Greg uh, Bitgood, who I'm assuming is the Greg B in the room, has done a little bit of work with, with those guys. Um, so it should be, the number 82 basically is all of the private school programs plus all of the uh, Catholic districts and public districts that are in the province minus any public districts or Catholic districts that indicated to me that they weren't actively involved in distance education um, this particular year. So the number we came up with was 82, but I can also tell you that about 60% of the districts never got back to me to indicate whether or not they were involved. Um, in theory, the Ontario eLearning Consortium has about 20 board members. It'll vary from year to year between as low as at 17 in the last few years to a high of 23. There's also a Ontario Catholic eLearning Consortium, uh, which involves all of the Catholic schools. And if you actually look at their website, they include the information on every single Catholic school district in the province. But in many instances, and I know of at least three uh, in particular, those Catholic districts weren't offering distance ed this past year. Interestingly, there's also a Northern eLearning Consortium um, in the province of Ontario, which includes members. And you know, you've got the OELC, which includes both public and Catholic districts. You've got the Catholic. ELC, which just includes Catholic districts, and then you've got the Northern one, which right now just includes public districts, and the membership over the three of them um, it has overlap between them. So it's a really interesting situation that, that's developed there. But it's basically a group of partnerships, these consortiums. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with them, what they do essentially is they have their own district-based program, and the way the ministry is set up is that, in theory, any excess space that they have in their internal online offerings has to be made available to other school districts. In theory, the ministry sets a fee. I think last year it was $782 or $786, and they change it every year, and it usually increases by between $5 and $15 each year. Um, so if I'm in, say, the Windsor-Essex School District and I've got six extra spaces in my grade 10 math class, someone in the Toronto District School Board could enroll in one of those six spaces. And in theory, Toronto District School Board is supposed to pay me $682. What these consortiums have done is they've decided that you know, these things are all going to end up being a wash eventually. You know, I'm going to and take in five students this year, but I might have six students that are enrolled in programs from other districts. Um, so they've essentially decided to waive the fees amongst consortium members as a way of you know, providing this cooperative um, consortium. Uh, so that's essentially where the idea of the consortiums come from. So looking at the activity, and, and uh, as I mentioned, the first time anyone bothered to sort of count this was uh, the Canadian Teachers Federation in a report that they published back in 99-2000. It was really the first time anyone gave a national figure as to the approximate number of K-12 students involved in distance education. And at the time, they pegged it at about 25,000, which was essentially half a percent of all of the K-12 students in the country. Um, if you're curious, Tom Clark did a, a similar statistic in uh, the U.S. Actually, it was in 2000 was when he published his. So it was again for the 99-2000 school year, and he estimated that there was 40 to 50 thousand students in the U.S. involved. Now, given the fact that the U.S. has approximately 10 times our population, it's reasonable to think that they have 10 times of the K-12 student population, but yet they only had between um, 60 and well, between 60 and 100 percent more students. Um, you know, they essentially had between 15 and 25,000 more students involved, so about twice as much. So historically, we were actually, you know, much greater users of, of distance ed at the K-12 level than our, our American counterparts. Now, as time has gone by, one of the things that you see there is, is those numbers have jumped, and there's been a steady climb from year to year. And in some cases, you see there's approximate years there. In some cases, it's a range depending upon the numbers that are available. Um, last year, it was just under 285,000 that we were able to uh, figure out, which worked out to the 5% of the K-12 population. Um, if you're curious as to how that compares to our American counterparts, depending upon the figures that you use, um, they will have somewhere between 
um, anywhere from a low of 2 million to a high of 8 million students involved in online and blended learning. Now, the key there is that and blended learning part. Um, INACO is the organization that tends to uh, support most of these figures that you see coming out. And in the last three or four years, um, INACO has, has really sort of co-opted the notion of blended learning to be um, included with the idea of online learning. Uh, part of that, I would say, is, is more of a, an advocacy, advocacy kind of thing. I'd also say part of it is an ideological and political thing. Um, the fact is, the numbers that we have in Canada don't include a blended learning. And to give you one example, um, the program LEARN, which is in Quebec, um, has approximately 150,000 students last year that they worked with that were enrolled in schools but using the LEARN materials in a blended fashion. Um, you know, and that's just one program, but that one program essentially would increase the total number of people involved in K-12 online and blended learning in Canada by 50% just from our, you know, first number. Uh, the province of Ontario has a goal that they're going to have, I think it's 20% or 25% of all students learning in a blended fashion uh, by, if I remember correctly, it's 2016 is their goal date. Um, you know, if we were to count those numbers, you know, the number of K-12 students in Ontario, that would jump the number quite considerably as well. So unfortunately, we can't make sort of that good U.S.-Canadian comparison anymore like we were able to in the past. And that's one, one of the faults of the fact that K-12 distance education, particularly K-12 online learning, has really become a political thing in the U.S., whereas in Canada, it's still much more about education, uh, which is a good thing, I think, on our end. Uh, breaking that number down for last year in terms of the number of people involved um, by province, it actually is quite interesting when you start looking at this. Um, you've got folks like BC and Alberta on the high end with 12 and 10 percent of their uh, programs, or sorry, of their uh, students involved in distance education in some form or another. Um, sort of coming in around the middle, you've got provinces like Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan that are getting close to or at the, um, per, or the national average. And then you've got really Atlantic Canada, Quebec, and the territories that are, you know, falling behind that. Although I'd note that the, the Northwest Territories, they are at 3.2 percent, which I think is, is actually um, quite interesting. Um, it, it ter includes them in terms of the number of students that, sorry, Glenn, I'm just seeing your question there. It includes uh, that program in terms of the number of programs and also in terms of the number of students that they indicated enrolled in distance education. My sense is, is that they're actually using that network a great deal for um, what we would, I guess, closely define as blended learning. And that would mean that many of the students, I would actually from what I understand of the program, say, suggest most of the students um, probably aren't included in the statistic that you see there for Manitoba in terms of roughly 5.8%. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the other thing that, that I'll talk about with these numbers, you'll notice that there's an asterisk there by the number for Saskatchewan, and this is a good example uh, of the idea that a lot of this, you know, numbers game, if you will, is difficult to pin down. Um, in the case of Saskatchewan, the ministry thinks that there's approximately 2,000, I think it was 2,100 students that they indicated were participating in distance education. When I started contacting the individual programs involved um, that you know, were offering distance education and asking them, you know, how many students do you have, eight of the uh, what was it exactly? Eight of the Saskatchewan 21 programs got back to me, and those eight of the 21 programs said that they um, were already enrolling. It was a little bit less than 8,000 students. Um, you know, so looking at previous number, you know, that's four times what the ministry thought was involved. So, or at least reported were involved. So when you're starting to look at these, um, the, 
you know, in some cases, it really is a guessing game. In other cases, not so much. Um, you know, I'll look at jurisdictions like Newfoundland or British Columbia, where the ministry can tell me the exact number of students involved, courses were taken, which courses were enrolled. In the case of Newfoundland, I can get gender breakdowns, and that's just all from public documents. Um, you know, so some provinces are quite good at these kinds of things. Other provinces. You know, as as Randy indicates in the um, the chat window there, you know, it is just uh, you know self-reporting by the programs themselves, or in some cases a best guess by the programs themselves. You know, you'll see Nova Scotia and New Brunswick up there both have you know the tildes in front of them, indicating that those are approximate numbers. In terms of, I guess, looking at the regulatory regime, so you've seen sort of the level of activity, how much is going on, what provinces are up and down in terms of the amount of activity, which ones have a high number of programs. Um, there are really sort of four kinds of regulatory regimes that we see across the country. Um, well, three kinds of regulatory regimes, I should say, and then regimes where there is no specific regulation related to distance education, which I guess is kind of really a fourth kind of regime, but it's a regime that isn't a regime, if you will. Um, the first is where there is legislative language that specifically governs how distance education operates in the province. And in some cases, this is based upon um, you know, very extensive guidelines. In other cases, that legislative language is a, a little more vague. So in the case of British Columbia, for example, there are a couple of sections, one in the Public Schools Act and one in the Independent Schools Act, that outline essentially how distance education is going to be funded and regulated. And then in addition to that, they've got uh, policy documents and in, in, uh, particularly individual uh, what they call distributed learning agreements, in the case of British Columbia, that they have with each of the individual programs. And it's more of the regulatory stuff, the, the agreements that really provide a, a comprehensive notion of how these programs are going to operate from you know, quantitative audits to qualitative reviews that are put in place. In the case of Nova Scotia, it's a little bit different because the legislative language is actually the collective agreement that the government has with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. Um, and it's the only one of its kind in Canada, although there are some individual examples in Ontario. So some of the uh, local agreements in Ontario do contain language, I think with at least three of them um, related to distance education. But in the case of Nova Scotia, you know, it's a full section that I think it's 17 or 18, might be 21 now that I'm thinking about it off the top um, of my head, that deal specifically with how distance ed is going to be operated in the province from things like specific professional development that's required for those involved in online or distance education to um, support that schools have to put in place uh, so they uh, have to have local facilitators so local facilitators have to have time provided in their schedules for uh, facilitating this to um, an actual advisory committee that has to be put together um, to oversee how this works. And I see Sarah typing, so I'm sure she's going to um, jump in with some more information on this. And in the report, I think it was from, it might have been the 2011 or 2012 year, um, we actually went through and picked apart each of these particular um, sections that were in there to give folks a sense as to everything that was included. So uh, if you're not familiar with the reports, if you haven't been a regular reader, it's actually worth going back and looking at some of the older ones as well because some of these issues are picked up from year to year depending upon um, when they come across our radar screen or when, they, uh, when we're able to get people involved to talk about them. Um, another way in which you commonly see are policy handbooks. So if you look, for example, at uh, New Brunswick, Ontario, and Manitoba, they essentially have a handbook that says this is how distance education is going to operate. And if you want to participate in distance education, you have to essentially follow the guidelines that are in this handbook. And uh, I notice Howard is in the room here from Manitoba. Uh, I know they've been in the process of, of revising their handbook uh, over the past couple of years. And, uh, last I checked with them, I believe it was somewhere above Howard's level within the ministry looking for uh, approval. Um, so I'm hoping that when the 2014 one comes out that um, that may have already gone through the official channels and that we'll have a, a new type of uh, regime or at least some new specific regulations that we can talk about in Manitoba based upon that updated 
um, policy manual. And then uh, the third way that I mentioned earlier is, is you know this idea of individual agreements. And as you can see here, this is is the one that tends to be the most common one, although. Part of that is because four of the eight places that are listed there are places that don't have their own distance ed programs or are only just starting to grow their own programs. Uh, so those individual agreements are, and often cases, in the case of say PEI, UConn, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, agreements between their individual ministries of education and ministries of education or individual distance ed programs in other jurisdictions. So for example, PEI would have an agreement with uh, their Ministry of Education with the Ministry of Education in New Brunswick to offer them distance education. In the case of, say, the Northwest Territories, I know they've got a uh, an agreement with the Alberta Distance Learning Center. I believe they've got an agreement with um, a couple of other individual district-based programs in the province. In the Yukon, I know they use the Northern British Columbia Distance Ed School for some of those programs. They also use the Alberta Distance Learning Center, specifically the Vista Virtual uh, School that they offer, which is for most of their French offerings. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we've got three jurisdictions. I used the example of Saskatchewan a little bit earlier that have um, no uh, distance, or no policy whatsoever. Can you hold on a sec? I've got a call coming in that I've got to take. I apologize about this. Okay, yes, we'll just take a little break here and uh, we'll be back. If anybody has any questions, now would be a good time to put them in the comment box. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm down here in Connecticut and my uh, actually my wife is visiting me because she's still living in Canada and um, she went out to find something and she told me that she was going to call if she got lost. So when I saw her number show up there, um, obviously, I was concerned that she didn't quite know where she was going, and sure enough, she was lost somewhere down here in, in the Shelton area. So, um, apologies about that. Uh, so, as I mentioned, three of those provinces don't have any. In the case of uh, Newfoundland and Quebec, it's been some time that they haven't had any. In fact, uh, as best I can tell, there's never really been much in the way of, of policy developed at the ministry level. Um, in the case of Saskatchewan, the example as I gave earlier was, you know, they had policies at the ministry level, and when they decided to devolve distance education to the districts, they essentially those policies became moot. Looking at some of the trends that are um, are happening across the the country, um, and Brandy mentioned this in, in the text area below when we were talking about the individual. Uh, provinces and the programs that are going here, but you know, as you can clearly see from the data, the amount and number, the number of students, the number of programs, and even the availability of distance education for K-12 students is growing every single year. Um, part of that, I think, is an increased awareness by schools of, and school districts of the programs that are currently available. Uh, part of it, I think, is a, a desire by a lot of these organizations to essentially provide additional opportunities to their students. Either students that aren't being served right now, or just looking at, okay, how are some more interesting, innovative ways in which we can serve our students? Um, also, as, as Randy mentioned in the chat area before, Randy's stealing all my points here today, I see. Um, you know, one of the problems that we have is that in many cases, a lot of this is, is self-report. Um, you know, there are some ministries that do a great job in terms of actually keeping track of what is happening at the K-12 level when it comes to distance education. They can give me exact figures, they know exact numbers. There are other provinces where that's not the case, and, and if you look at the trend section of the report, I give some specific examples to this. Um, you know, in the case of uh, Ontario as one of the examples. Um, Ontario will, about this time of the year, be able to get me the exact numbers of students that participate in distance education. Not for this school year, not for last school year, but the school year before that. So we're in like 2013, 2014 now. It's not the 2012, 2013 numbers I'd be getting about now. It's actually the 2011, 2012 numbers that I'd be getting about now. You know, you can't really make good decisions when it comes to policy matters 
if the data that you're actually using, the official data that you have available, is two years old. You know, we're coming up on the end of this school year, and the data that they have available in terms of the official numbers, you know, and they've got a policy that they want to, you know, have a specific number of students learning in a blended fashion by a specific date. How are they ever going to know that they've actually met that date when all of their data, all of their statistics are two years old? Uh, I guess they'll know two years after the fact whether or not they meet their goal, but they, they certainly won't meet no as the time is coming. Um, one of the biggest differences that we see between Canada and the U.S., although, in all honesty, this is kind of consistent with other, um, with other Commonwealth countries. Uh, unions have been supportive of distance education. I use the term cautiously supportive because in many instances they do have that, you know, I mean, you have to really, I guess, understand what the role of the union is. The role of the union is to ensure due process for their members. In the case of distance education, this is not something that they've really had to face before in any sort of large significant numbers like they are now. So one of the things that they're trying to figure out is, you know, what does this mean for our membership? You know, what is an equivalent workday? Not an equal workday, because if you're teaching online, that's not like teaching in the classroom. You know, it's not a eight to three kind of, you know, activity that you're doing you know, with grading and everything else you know, afterwards. What is an equal amount of work? What is an equal or an equivalent, sorry, amount of work? What is an equivalent quality of life for an online teacher in comparison to a face-to-face -face teacher? What sort of safeguards do we need to put in place that will allow for innovation to occur, that won't stifle innovation, but will still ensure that our online teachers aren't being taken advantage of? You know, these are the kinds of things unions are trying to figure out. But at the same time, you know, they've been incredibly supportive of this. Uh, the Ontario Teach uh, Secondary School Teachers Federation has passed a couple of resolutions over the past uh, couple of AGMs that they've had that have actually called on, you know, increasing the availability of distance, particularly online learning, to um, students in the province. You've had the Alberta Teachers Association that on one hand has been one of the most vigorous uh, proponents, or I guess I should say opponents, of the cuts to distance education's funding that happened in the province of Ontario last year, and in fact were reversed about a week ago. Um, you know, they were leading the charge. The, the website that you, know, you went to, stopdecuts.com or .org, was actually organized by the Alberta Teachers Association. You know, so they were fighting to get funding restored for this program. At the same time, they also have come out fairly strongly against online charter schools in that, that uh, province, although if you look at the rationale for that, you can clearly see that it's a pedagogical rationale. They, and when you look at the evidence uh, in this state side in terms of online charter schools, you can see that they're, you know, they don't do very well. Uh, the British Columbia Teachers Federation has probably done more research into online learning um, in that province than any other organization in Canada when you're looking at K-12 distance ed research. Uh, it's actually, uh, you know, one of sort of the, the, the nice things about it. You know, so they have been supportive, but at the same time, there's still a little bit that, you know, they don't understand about it, they need to figure out about it, and it's really a tightrope that they're trying to walk. You know, how do you allow these programs to occur? How do we provide these wonderful pedagogical opportunities for our students but you still protect their teachers. So, uh, and obviously the last one that we've got here is, is, you know, more research is needed. One of the, the biggest problems, and this is not just in Canada, but really all jurisdictions that are, are involved with K-12 online learning, is this notion of we have a lot of decisions being made at the political level or at the policy level, you know, or in our case the ministry level, and there's not a lot of research to support taking action one way or the other. And you know the type of system that we are operating in right now is that there's not a lot of funding being put towards research to make these better informed regulatory decisions. So um, I want to talk a little bit uh, before I close, and I'm going to try to zip through this because I do want to get time for questions and answers here, but I do want to highlight these. 
Um, since they were an addition to this particular year, and as I mentioned, four of the five of these programs have actually been featured a fair amount in previous years of the report, but one of the things that we pulled out this year specifically was looking at the nature of federal programs. Um, federal, the federal government is basically responsible for roughly a million and a half people across the country. Um, those are all people of, you know, that fall under Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada. So they're all First Nations, Métis, or Inuit um, individuals. They are responsible for just over 2,200 schools, and that works out to about 140,000 students. Now, about 1,800 of those students are involved in distance education. If you remember back to um, I think it was slide three or four, and I won't go back, but it works out to about, I think it's uh, approximately one and a half percent of the um, folks that are involved there. And there are five programs that you've got here. Looking at these five programs, you know, it's quite interesting because, you know, when you look at the kinds of things that distance ed could do, that could offer, um, students, these programs sort of exemplify that kind of thing. You know, so you've got the Enos Key Junior Program, which is, is one of the newer programs that are there. Um, you know, they're only six years old as of, well, actually five years old as the end of this year, sorry. Um, you know, they started off in their first year of operation with eight courses. Now they've got more than 30. And one of the things that they're really focusing upon, and the online environment allows them to do this, is focusing upon native language courses. You know, each of the individual schools that participate in this program don't have a, enough students that they could warrant many of these language courses. But when you pull those students together in the online environment, now all of a sudden you've got that critical mass that can allow these students to take advantage of these things. And one of the things that we continue to hear, um, you know, about our First Nations communities is the fact that many of their languages are dying because they're not being taught in schools. And, you know, they're not being taught in schools simply because we just don't have economies of scale to be able to offer these kinds of things to them. You know, and, and here's a program that is actually doing some wonderful things on this front, you know, trying to keep some of these languages alive. Um, you know, and I, I suppose because they're operated as a private school in the province, um, much like Kiwetinik, which is another one I'll mention here now, in theory, that would mean that any student could pay to enroll in one of these courses and learn these kinds of languages. You know, so there's a lot of, of, of potential kinds of things here. Oops, I hit the wrong button there. Um, Credenda is another one, and, and it's one of the older ones. Actually, it's the second oldest of, of the First Nations programs that are out there. Um, actually, I say second, now it might be third, now that I'm thinking of it. They're based in Saskatchewan. Uh, I don't know if Vince is in the room today. Um, nope, not. But Vince Hill has, has been the, the principal there, I think, since it, it began. As you can see, they've, over the, I guess, almost a decade now, they've had about 5,000 students that are 5,000 courses that have been completed. Um, and you can see the, the retention and success rates, which I think is, you know, an important thing to mention. You'll see I've got that highlighted for several of the programs here because typically speaking, particularly at the high school level, you know, the success rate, the completion rate, uh, the graduation rate tends to be in anywhere from 20 to 40 percent for Aboriginal youth in our country. You know, and here you've got a program that's providing, you know, anywhere from two to four times that level of success to these kinds of students. Another Ontario-based program is Kiwetinik Internet High School, or KIHS is, is actually how you see it, um, you know, written a fair amount. Um, they're the oldest of all of the online programs. They began as a, a, actually as a private school in Ontario. Um, back in, in 99. They work with 13 communities in northern Ontario, 10 of which are flying communities, which means they're only accessible by, um, by plane. And interestingly, all of the communities that they're in um, are communities that don't have their own high schools. They have an elementary school in the community, but if the student wanted to continue on to go on to high school, they'd actually have to leave the community. And as someone who's had, had a chance to work with the, these programs, uh, at least four or five of them, um, over the past year on a separate project, one of the things that, that strikes me, um, you know, I, I've sat in meetings with, with the, the ministry in Ottawa, uh, with ANC in Ottawa, and, and I've listened to them talk about how a lot of the students that they send out of the community to go to high school, 
because of you know having to be torn away from the community that they've known and, and you know all the, the social issues that are facing Aboriginal youth in our country. Um, the comment that often gets used is you know when we send them away to go to school they often come home in boxes. And uh, you know that was a, a real sobering comment that that I heard at, at many of these meetings. And you know, so when you've got a program like this, that instead of having to take that individual and fly them out of the community, uh, it allows them to stay in the community, and you still have like a seventy percent retention rate. When even traditional high schools um, that focus upon Aboriginal students are getting twenty to forty percent. You know, to me, these are, are great programs that I think really need to be highlighted. Um, Joe mentioned about the um, S, uh, S, uh, or SC Cyber Program. It used to be the Sunchild eLearning Community. Um, they've now rebranded to SC Cyber. Uh, they began in 2000, and as you can see, again, completion rates of over 70%, a graduation rate of 80%. You know, another strong success story uh, that we've got within our First Nations communities. Uh, and finally, we've got Wapaskawa. Um, and I always pronounce that a little bit wrong. And if, if uh, Howard was in the room here, Howard Bernstein, who I'm sure, as Randy has mentioned, is one of the uh, other board members for Can E Learn, um, they would, uh, he'd probably correct my pronunciation of that. But they're the most recent of the programs. And again, they're one that actually have entered into a partnership with all 48 First Nations that are represented in the province of Manitoba. And, um, you know, they've, Got you know approximately I think it's a, the exact number something like 89 point something percent pass rate you know I mean and I think this is really important uh, for a number of reasons a it shows the potential that online learning has for students but more importantly um, if you've been following the news in the past couple of weeks one of the things that you've uh, you may have heard is that um, many of these First Nations programs are funded directly by the uh, federal department directly by ANSI. And ANSI has decided that online schools aren't actually schools. They are organizations that provide a service. And because of that, they essentially have eliminated all the funding for them. So I know in the case of like Credenda, which is the one you see pictured there from the Prince Albert uh, newspaper, but I know Wapaska was in the same boat. I'm pretty sure that Amos Key is in the same boat. I'm not sure about uh, SC Cyber in Alberta. But these are programs that essentially now have no funding as of the end of this year because they aren't considered schools. And you know, this is something that I think as an online learning community, as a K-12 community, that, that we need to be concerned about. That you know, we need to you know, be, I know Vince and, and Howard have both been working with their local uh, MPs, but it is something that I think that you know, all of us who are interested in and involved in and invested in uh, K-12 online and blended learning need to be aware of because you know, I mean, ANSI is, is a government agency just like any other Ministry of Education, many of which are represented here. And while um, I know most of the folks that I see in the room that I'm familiar with are quite supportive of this, um, as was ANSI up until a few weeks ago. So uh, it is something to sort of keep on our radar screens. Um, just to finish off, and I think uh, Dan mentioned this at the beginning, but here is the URL that brings you to all six years' worth of reports plus some other materials that uh, we've been preparing over the years. And um, at that stage, uh, I know we've had some comments and, and questions that have been coming up through the chat box. Um, if I did happen to miss a question that uh, you posted as you were going through, uh, please repost it, because I, I, I missed it if I haven't already answered it. And uh, as well, I'll release the mic in case folks have questions that they'd rather ask um, auditorily again. And I will scroll back one slide so you can get that URL again, Joe. Okay, we have gone to multi-speaker mode now for the Q&A. If you have a question, you can grab the microphone in the top bar, click it once to begin talking, click it again when you're done to avoid any feedback. And I think we've got some uh, great, uh, great discussions going on in the chat, so we can turn those into voice questions. Uh, before we do that, though, I just want to remind people that uh, May 7th, uh, please come back and we'll have another. Uh, I know it's Slovig, and I 
apologize if I'm pronouncing your wrong in, or your name incorrectly there, uh, um, asked if most of the students are at, typically at the high school age. Yes, the, the vast majority of students that are involved in, in distance education in Canada are at the high school level. Um, there are some at the elementary level. In most provinces, that means correspondence education. In fact, in the vast majority of provinces, the only option for elementary students to take distance education is through a more traditional correspondence mode. Uh, British Columbia is one of the few provinces that um, where that isn't the case, although I would still suggest that the majority of elementary level distance education in British Columbia is still at the correspondence uh, mode, but not all of it. And I'm, I know you know, Greg Bickard's in the room there. I assume that's Greg with the Greg B that's there. Um, he's uh, with um, Heritage Christian Online School, and I'm fairly confident that your elementary offerings have a combination of print and online material. Greg, if I'm not mistaken, and you can correct me if I'm wrong there, uh, Greg. Um, but for the most part, it is, um, as Randy describes it there, it's homeschooling with correspondence-based materials, at least at the elementary level. Um, in terms of the breakdown, I would say that I wouldn't be surprised if it's 80 to 90 percent of the numbers that you saw there were high school kids. Um, I <coughs> Michael, it's uh, Terry Anderson speaking. Uh, thanks again. That's, uh, that's great to have these annual updates. Um, I wonder if you could talk a, a bit about the, um, the, the institutions who are sponsoring this and specifically following up on your last question about the, the correspondence to the online and especially the synchronous modes of delivery. Have, have most of the activity, has it come from the big uh, centralized institutions like in Alberta, BC, and Ontario, who were correspondent schools who are now doing online learning? Or is it mostly um, switching to synchronous delivery and maybe more decentralized at, at the local school level? Um, well, to start off, Randy, you asked about the, sorry, Terry, um, you asked about the um, the sponsors. Um, looking here, I mean, as you can see, Open School BC was historically a correspondence-based program, and um, what ends up, you know, they're really a, a purveyor of correspondence-based material now that schools can use. But when you're looking at folks like, say, Virtual High School or Heritage Christian Online Schools, uh, Learn in Quebec, those are online programs, and they're using a variety of materials. I know Greg's uh, program, uh, Heritage Christian Online, and uh, Steve Baker's program, uh, the Virtual High School Ontario, uh, are both primarily asynchronous uh, using course management systems. Um, I know VHS uses uh, Desire to Learn. I'm not sure what program you use, Greg, in terms of an, a learning management system. Um, for some reason, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking you have a prepared, oh, Moodle, thank you. Um, uh, Randy caught you there. I know Learn actually does a lot of synchronous based material. Um, and when I'm looking, I guess, across the country, when you're looking at you know these 251 programs that are available, uh, the vast majority of them are doing asynchronous online uh, learning. Uh, so we're not seeing a lot of, well, I should, there's still significant amounts of correspondence education happening. In many instances, it is. Um, a, um, the programs that are being offered at the ministry level. So Howard, for example, in Manitoba is in the room, and I know they still are offering some uh, correspondence education um, in addition to the web-based stuff that they're supporting as well as an instructional television uh, model that they're doing, and they're one of the few that are still doing that. Uh, the folks in the territories are still doing a bit of video conferencing. I know ADLC. Um, still does a lot of correspondence education. In fact, I think the vast majority of what ADLC does is correspondence education. Um, you know, and to give you a sense, if you look at the Ontario numbers, um, 76,000 involved. Uh, of those 76,000, about 25,000 of them come from TV Ontario, which is the, the ones who are responsible for the correspondence program in um, that province. So overall, I mean, I would suggest that the Asynchronous online approach is the dominant approach. However, there is still, and probably the second largest approach would be still using those correspondence legacy materials. 
there are some programs that are doing some synchronous, although they're small enough that I could list off the ones where synchronous is the dominant model, you know, on one hand. So, you know, it is a small number. Okay, with that uh, question, we are very close to our the end of our scheduled time, uh, and we don't necessarily want to keep our presenter beyond that. So uh, if, unless you have uh, very, very quick questions, um, we'll probably wrap it up fairly soon. Well, maybe Rand Sure, I, I'll jump in then. Just, uh, it's interesting, Terry, that you raise that point because there are the formal recognized larger scale programs. Some of them are provincial based and some of them aren't. But in the research that I've been involved in, uh, particularly just lately in Alberta, uh, there are a number of programs that don't hit the radar scope, um, either being designated as being online or they may be homeschooled. But a lot of the methodologies and practices of blended learning approaches or online technologies and mediums are integral in, in them. Uh, and also seeing a lot more um, emerging classroom-based practices. Um, you know, if you take the flipped learning and you kind of expand that further, seeing a lot of push against the sort of structured agrarian timetable in the K-12 space to a more flexible learning approach. And that is being driven not only just by programs that are formally in that place to do it, but by a lot of classroom-based practices and schools that are being creative in terms of how they manage their, uh, their learning offerings and op op options for, for students. So I've seen some elementary schools who have three days that are in uh, the school and two days are online. Uh, for elementary programs. I've seen situations, like I mentioned about the homeschools, where they're at home for three days, two days are in the, the school. Well, when they're at home, teachers are engaging with students uh, virtually through learning management systems, through online uh, web-based collaborative sessions, etc. Same thing with some of the First Nations programs. Some of the times that they're spending, like SE Cyber, they have students that are actually in a physical location in the community that the band supports and add and supports with them. But a lot of the learning is structured online with the instructor at a distance, um, but the students themselves are in a face-to-face -face situation with support mechanisms. So there's a wide variety of programs and approaches that are quite interesting. I, that's where the term for me blended uh, is more speaks to online as well as a combination of the face-to-face where and as appropriate. Andy, I don't think we're going to get a, get uh, all the problems and the challenges and the opportunities of the K-12 uh, world solved in this hour, but uh, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, that's a really nice to get your update, and uh, I see Solveig is here from asking about MOOCs, too. Maybe we can just squeeze an answer to that in, and maybe, Solveig, you can type if there's much K-12 uh, DE in uh, Iceland before we wrap it up. Sure, it's actually uh, interesting that you asked that question, Slovig, because uh, the only person that, as I know right now, who has run um, MOOCs in the K-12 environment in Canada, actually has just stepped out of the room, that would have been Verena Roberts. She's actually run a couple um, programs that, that have been done in conjunction with schools in both Alberta and British Columbia, although in many instances, actually I think in all instances, they are. Um, they have been MOOCs that were offered as a a co-curricular activity. So they weren't actually done as a course that was done for credit. They were done uh, on top of things. And um, one of the things um, that you know I've actually written about on my blog a couple of times is just this space in general, where we've seen MOOCs most commonly occur in the K-12 environment um, has typically been for teacher or K-12 online learning environment has typically been for uh, teacher development um, uh, or teacher professional development, sorry. And, uh, you know, there are a number of, of ones that are focused specifically upon how to teach online. Um, the University of California, Irvine actually has a complete certificate in online teaching that um, is being offered in MOOC format. Uh, there's an organization in North Carolina that uh, um, 
I'm trying to remember the name of it off the top of my head now, but it is not coming to me that have had three different MOOCs on digital learning. Uh, one just on introducing it into your district, another one that looked at specifically coaching digital learning, and then a third one that focused specifically upon uh, using digital learning within the mathematics environment. Um, you know, so that's sort of where we've seen most of the, the MOOC activity happening. And, and um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Verena is only the, the only one that's done them thus far for actual K-12 students. Um, with the exception of the Michigan Virtual University, uh, which runs Michigan Virtual High School, had one earlier this year that actually included both K-12 teachers and K-12 students that uh, Rick Ferdig was the primary uh, person responsible for that. And I know he's also written a little bit on this environment. So, you know, there's a little bit going on, but it's small enough that, you know, well, I've taken three minutes and I've been able to list off just about everything that's happening in that space. Okay, and uh, again, thank you, Michael. Uh, if there are any very last-minute questions, uh, we can probably squeeze them in. But I do want to make sure that I say thank you. And uh, thank you to our audience as well for coming to yet another session. We have two more uh, this year. We have May 7th, Norman Vaughn, Marty Cleveland Ninnis, Randy Garrison, and then again on June 4th. So please join us again. And a reminder that the slides and a full recording of this session will be available on our site uh, shortly, cider.athabascau.ca. All right, and the microphone is open, so if anyone wants to grab it, you can do so, or just post your final thoughts in the chat box. Okay, it looks like we're wrapping up. So yes, once again, thank you, Michael, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you again uh, in upcoming years. All right, and we will turn off the recording function now.